Kusin yo had to a sack, Luca Eddy, I had Kaguantan Yeti, ye hit dak. Welcome to the 13th annual State of Indian Nations. We're so excited that you could join us here today at the Knight Studio here in Washington, D.C., in the Museum. My name is Jacqueline Peta, and I'm the Executive Director of the National Congress of American Indians. The largest, the oldest, native, most representative American Indian Alaska Native organization serving the broad interests of tribal governments and communities all across the country. As our part of our effort to further the goals of Indian country, NCAI strives to bring together tribal leaders, um, government officials, members of Congress to discuss challenges, opportunities, and most importantly, solutions. And that's what today is all about. We have a full house here today of tribal leaders, members of Congress, senior federal officials, and so many others who are dedicated to the good work for Indian country. I want to thank each of you for attending today, and for those of you watching and listening and events all across the country. Across Indian country, we have more than 50 listening watch groups that are happening. And we have community leaders, businesses, have gathered to watch this, this event together. We're pleased to be joined by um, some tribes online live, uh, via live stream, the Confederate, Confer, Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation, the Miami Tribe of Oklahoma, the United Yuma Nation, the Smith River Rancheria, and the Navajo Nation. And we encourage all those who are watching live stream and those here in the studio to actually join us in our, through our social media tools. So you can tweet your comments and ask questions using the official 2015 State of Indian Nations hashtag, which is S-O-I-N 2015. And you can also share your photos versus Facebook or Instagram. I'd like to recognize some of the uh, guests that we have here in the audience today that we are honored to be uh, to have here with us. We have staff from the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs and the House um, Subcommittee on Indian Affairs and Alaska Native Affairs. We have staff representing Senator Reid, Heitkamp, and other members of Congress. And from the administration, we have the solicitor of the Department of Interior, Hillary Tompkins. We have the assistant secretary, Kevin Washburn, uh, Dr. Yvette Rubido from IHS, Raina Thiel from the White House, Lillian Sparks Robinson from the administration of Native, American, um, Native Americans, Bill Mendoza from the White House Initiative on American Indian and Alaska Native Education. And we also have key representatives from other agencies, including the Departments of Agriculture, Commerce, Education, FCC, um, uh, Interior, Justice, Veterans Affairs, Homeland Security. We're also um, honored to be joined by former Senator Ben Nighthorse Campbell and Ernie Stevens Jr. from NIGA. We're also here joined by members of the NCAI board, in including Chairman Manuel Hart, who gave us the invocation this morning, and Lance Gumbs. We're joined by tribal leaders of more than a dozen tribes, including Chairman Timothy Ballou from the, the second from the Lummi Nation, Chief Kirk Francis from the Penobscot Nation. Leaders and staff of many of our partner organizations are also in the audience today, such as partners from MAST, USET, AHEC, NACA, NAFOA, NARF, NIEA, and NIGA. A lot of acronyms. <laughs> <laughs> We're honored to be here to have several important NCAI partners from outside of Indian Country to join us here today. We have Jenny Bacchus from Google. We have Pepe Estrada and Emily McDonald from Walmart. Mimua and Kathy Cochin from the Asian Pacific Island community. And we also have want to recognize our future leaders here that are joined us in Washington, D.C. We have in the audience Native students from the Georgetown, George Washington American Universities. And we have student parties watching across Indian country, including the Arizona State and Yale Universities. I especially want to take a moment and thank Senator Barrasso for taking time out of his busy day to be able to join us and to provide today's congressional response. As the new chairman of the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs, we look forward to continuing our close working relationship with the senator and his key team. And now it's time for me to be able to introduce the 21st president of the National Congress of American Indians, Brian Clattisby, to deliver the State of Indian Nations Address. 
President Clasby was elected in October 2013, and he's also served for the Swinomish Indian Tribal Community as chairman since 1997. He has spent his career furthering in the interests of Native peoples to help create jobs, open new trade opportunities, and reinvigorate the fish and seafood industries. He's a respected industry leader in his home state of Washington and throughout the Northwest and across the nation. Please help join, help me welcome President Brian Clattisby. My fellow tribal leaders, members of Congress, members of the administration, friends and partners gathered here and watching from home, I want to thank the Creator for this beautiful day, for allowing me the privilege of representing Indian Country, and providing the opportunity to honor our history and celebrate the promise of our nation-to-nation -nation relationship. In this week, when we remembered a great civil rights leader, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and when our president delivered his annual State of the Union address. And unlike him, I do have one more election. <laughs> it is fitting that we take this time to consider the transformation and change that is underway in Indian country today. Indian country is leading. Indian country is innovating. Indian country is growing and the state of Indian nations grows stronger by the day. Tribal nations are steadily reclaiming our rightful place among the American family of governments. And we are doing this despite antiquated ways of thinking about native peoples and tribal governments and outdated policies that belong to another century. Today, we are not where we want to be in our relationship with the federal government, but we are glad we are not where we used to be. <clears throat> Today, I bring a simple message. From the tribes of the 21st century, we must tear down barriers to growth, simplify regulations that are limiting opportunities and acknowledge that tribes have the capability as governments to oversee our own affairs. As we reach out to the federal government as a true partner, we must continue to insist that the United States honors its trust responsibility to Native peoples. Honoring its trust responsibility means recognizing Indian country's legal authority to control its own destiny. It means respecting Native peoples for who we are, not who others think we are. And it means modernizing the trust relationship between our nations. These are things we can and must do. As a united Indian country, we are determined to create opportunities for success within our borders and beyond. This is a remarkable moment in our shared history. For the 566 federally recognized tribal nations and many state recognized tribes, for the more than five million native peoples living in cities or on reservations across this great land, these are the days that our ancestors prayed for. We must seize the opportunity to sustain our progress. As the 21st president of the National Congress of American Indians, I have been privileged to witness great progress over the past few years from our families to our tribal councils to Capitol Hill. We've worked with Republicans 
Democrats and independents in Congress to make country safer by reauthorizing the Violence Against Women Act. <clears throat> We made Indian country healthier by working together to permanently reauthorize the Indian Health Care Improvement Act. We made Indian country fairer by passing the Tribal General Welfare Exclusion Act to ensure that Indian people aren't unjustly taxed for benefits they receive from their own tribal governments. <clears throat> In the last six years, we have seen Congress and this administration work together to pass an unprecedented number of bipartisan bills that will improve opportunities for our peoples. Last month, I was proud to join hundreds of tribal leaders from across the nation as we participated in the sixth annual Tribal Nation Summit with President Obama. And of course, 2014 was also the year that we were privileged to have President Obama visit one of our homelands. The President told me his trip to Standing Rock Reservation had a prof profound impact and he urged his cabinet to follow his lead and make visiting Indian country a top priority in 2015. Today, I want to make a personal invitation to Speaker Boehner, Leader Pelosi, Majority Leader McConnell, and Minority Leader Reid, as well as every member of Congress, make it a goal to come to Indian Country this year. This week, Several members of Congress and representatives of the administration will visit the Navajo Nation. Let's make that visit the beginning of a year of unprecedented engagement between tribal nations and our federal partners. Among all the gains in recent years, we've also suffered some losses. Close to my heart and to many across Indian country was the loss of my friend and mentor. He was not only a Native American hero, but he was an American hero, Billy Frank Jr. Billy, like me, was from the Pacific Northwest. His people, the Nisqually Nation, are fishing people like my people. At age 14, Billy was arrested for exercising his treaty rights by fishing the Nisqually River. As Billy simply put it, he wasn't a policy guy, he was a getting arrested guy. <laughs> Over the years, Billy was arrested more than 50 times for exercising his treaty rights. Now that's one of Billy's accomplishments that I have yet to achieve. <laughs> and those arrests laid the groundwork for an historic Supreme Court ruling which acknowledged that our treaties reserved our right to fish where we had for generations. After all, our rights as sovereign nations were not granted by the Constitution. They existed before there was a Constitution. <clears throat> now, if you don't know who Billy Frank was, you're not alone. The history that he lived that our people lived is a history that's not often taught in schools. 
but it is essential to understanding the connection between our nations, the trust that defines our partnership, and the responsibility that is entrusted to all federal officials, especially members of Congress. That's why as long as I knew Billy, Billy had the same message, tell your story. Tell your story, tell your story. Billy knew that no one could tell our story better than we can. For those of you who may not know, let me tell you the story of our trust relationship. If the story has a theme, it's a story of pride and resilience, bookended by self-determination on either end. There are too many people that believe that when Europeans got to this land and moved west, they simply claimed empty land for themselves. But that's not true. In fact, the US government signed more than 400 treaties. And today is a special day for us in the Northwest. It was 160 years ago today that my dad's great-grandfather, Kel Kaltzut, signed the Point Elliott Treaty between the Swinomish tribe and the United States. My dad's great-grandfather. My dad proudly carries on that name. Dad is 81 years old, watching this speech. And like his namesake, he inspires me every single day. Tribal nations like ours accepted a smaller land base. In exchange, the federal government made three basic promises to guard our right to govern ourselves, to enable tribal governments to deliver essential governmental services, and to help manage our remaining lands and resources in our best interests. These treaties, they're older than many US state constitutions. In fact, our treaty, the Point Elliott Treaty, preceded the existence of the state of Washington by three and a half decades. All of our, all of our treaties continue today to stand as the supreme law of the land. Every member of Congress and federal official is responsible for carrying out that trust, whether the member has a tribe in their district or not. Part of their job description is to make sure that the United States of America honors its commitments and lives up to its word. After all, this trust, it's not a handout. It's a contract. It's a commitment. It's their duty to honor it. So why do I mention this history now? The nation-to-nation -nation relationship between the United States of America and Indian country has reached a crossroad. Many tribes today are on the forefront of innovative 21st century governance. But don't take my word for it. As I mentioned earlier, I invite you to come and see for yourselves. Come to the Okeowigne Pueblo, where you will see 700-year-old homes being rehabilitated. The name of the Pueblo says it all, place of the strong people. Come to Shaktulik, Alaska, where you will meet the first cavity-free elementary classes. <clears throat> this is a success story. This is the direct result of the dental health therapist workforce, the first of its kind in the nation. To date, 40,000 people have been treated 
at 30% of the cost. Now other states are studying how they can replicate the success that Alaska has achieved. Come to the Lummi Nation, where you'll see the first tribally developed and operated commercial wetland mitigation bank in the United States. More than 2,000 acres that are creating income streams for the tribal government while preserving fishing streams for salmon and shellfish. Many tribes in our nation are engines of economic growth, not just for native people, but for non-native people also. In fact, there are nearly a quarter million native-owned businesses across the United States. The five tribes in Idaho, they contribute more than $850 million to the state's economy. And in have increased statewide employment by more than 10,000 jobs. The 11 tribal nations in Minnesota have collectively contributed more than $2.7 billion to the local economy while employing 41,000 native and non-native Minnesotans. These are more than Native American success stories. They are American success stories. And, they're, and we're ready to write many more in the years to come. Of course, there is much more work to be done. Too many of Indian country's reservations and communities are a long way from prosperity. Too many tribal communities are still plagued by high unemployment rates, high dropout rates, rampant drug and alcohol abuse, and an appalling suicide epidemic. Together, we must believe that we can overcome these challenges. Of course, trust itself is based on respect. And part of modernizing our trust relationship means modernizing the way Native people are respected and our civil rights are upheld. <clears throat> For this reason, I want to address an issue the National Congress of American Indians has worked on for almost 50 years. I want to talk about the negative stereotypes that Native peoples continue to be subjected to in our society. In particular, I want to talk about the name of the Washington, D.C. football team. Allow me to read from the pages of a Minnesota newspaper published one September day in 1863. And I quote, the state reward, the state reward for dead Indians has been increased to $200 for every redskin sent to purgatory. This sum is more than the dead bodies of all Indians east of the Red River are worth. History is clear on what that vile word meant. It was the scalped head of an American Indian man, woman, or child that trappers and hunters sold to the government like beaver pelts for money. Let me be very clear. The single most offensive name that you can call an American Indian is Red Skin. Thank God, today, a majority of people agree. 
In a recent national survey, 83% of Americans said they wouldn't use the R word to a Native American's face. <laughs> we know the team owner stands on the wrong side of history. He has dug in his heels and refuses to change. But why do you do it, FedEx? You point with pride to your policy and diversity inclusiveness, yet your name on the stadium, how do you defend perpetuating every kind of racism that 40% of your workforce has faced in one form or another? And why do you do it, Coca-Cola? For generations, you have been the company that taught the world to sing. Why do you defend a name that teaches the young generation to hate? Why do you do it, Verizon? Or Best Buy? Or HP? Or United Airlines? Many of us asso associate your companies with great American success stories. But think about it. Doesn't your defense of this name hearken back to the worst of America's failures? We as American Indians, we are appropriately honored as soldiers and teachers, students and first responders, CEOs and community leaders. There is no honor in the name of that team. It's long past that Washingtonians begin to see their fellow citizens through the eyes of respect and not as mascots for a football business that doesn't even have a fraction of the resilience, pride, or strength of character of any tribal nation in the United States. <clears throat> Now I know many of you say there are other issues that Indian country should focus on. My response is simple. This issue is no different than issue in any issue that we work on every day at the National Congress of American Indians. As we have since 1944, we will stand for the rights of Native peoples in every corner of our society, whether it's under the bright lights of the NFL or in the voting booths of South Dakota. This isn't a partisan issue. This isn't an issue of political correctness. We're not trying to make no news or make noise. We're trying to make progress. We're standing up with partners like the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, the NAACP, the National Council of La Raza, the Fritz Pollard Alliance, and senators and congressmen. We're standing with tribes and native organizations, religious leaders and journalists, school students, elected officials, and former NFL stars. <laughs> and we're calling on all fair-minded Americans to stand with us. <clears throat> to sustain our progress and build on it, we must rid ourselves of the old ways of thinking about our relationship. We must modernize our trust relationship. The next step in strengthening that relationship is for the federal government to trust tribes to determine their own future. This is about more than tribes having a seat at the table where decisions are made. This is about having policies and procedures that treat Na tribal nations as partners in governing. While we have a unique relationship with the federal government that will never end, it is time 
that our relationship reflects the true meaning of the word trust. The federal government needs to recognize tribal governments as true partners supporting the citizens of our nations. It needs to update its laws and regulations to reflect that 21st century partnership. In fact, I got a call last week from the 19th and 20th century, and they said that they wanted their rules and regulations back. <laughs> we need a relationship that's based on deference and support, not paternalism and control. Whether policy related to the Keystone Pipeline, or renewable energy, healthcare or education. Privacy rights or immigration. Too often, policy makers fail to surround themselves with people who understand tribal perspectives or seek input from tribal leaders and citizens. We don't want the federal government to solve our problems or dictate our future. We want to solve our own problems. We want to build our own future. We strongly believe that the greatest source of solutions that work for Indian country is Indian country itself. <clears throat> In fact, we are already charting this future. The native vote is influencing important elections electing Republicans, Democrats, and independents who stand with Indian country and uphold the trust responsibility. A growing number of Native people hold elective office. I'd like to take a moment to congratulate my good friend, an Alaska Native, and a former NCAI board member Alaska's new Lieutenant Governor, Byron Malott. <laughs> Byron not only embodies that Tlingit culture, but also the idea that Native issues aren't partisan issues. The power of the Native vote shows that when we base our work on the principle that our voice can and must be heard, we can work together to tear down the barriers to growth for tribal economies. We can give the next generation a better chance to work hard and see that work pay off. To that end, I see three important ways that we can modernize the trust relationship, simplifying and streamlining government regulations improving education, and focusing on the talents of tribal nations to create economic growth. Let me start where Ronald Reagan started, with simplifying government. Part of our frustration today is similar, similar to the frustration felt by state governments forced to live under regulations that were written for another age and time. I often speak about how our tribe lost a major contract with a large retailer. It happened because the federal government sat on our application that they had to approve for two years until the economy crashed and the retailer pulled out of the deal. Many tribal leaders have a similar story. The fact is that the federal agencies that oversee Indian country are not equipped to deal with all the decisions necessary to build an economy in the 21st century. Congress and the administration need to find ways to bring federal agencies out of the 19th century and into the 21st century. We need them to be partners for growth and not barriers to growth. Take access to capital. 
the ability to issue tax-exempt bonds to fund construction projects is the bread and butter of every modern state and local government. Yet this economic development tool is not available to tribes. The IRS only allows tribes to use tax-exempt bonds to fund essential government functions. It is time for the federal government to update its tax code to reflect its recognition of the equal status of tribal governments. <clears throat> the same goes for adoption. State courts say that a parent who adopts a child with special needs is eligible to receive a tax credit to help with that care of that child. But sadly, if a parent lives on a reservation and adopts a child with special needs, they don't get a tax credit. It's not an oversight. It's bad policy. It's outrageous and discriminatory, and it needs to change. <clears throat> or take law enforcement. Despite an act of Congress, the FBI continues to effectively deny tribal police access to the same National Crime Information Center database that they make available to states, to local cops, to campus police. So what does that mean? It means that if a protection order is issued in a domestic violence case, the tribal court often cannot enter that order into the federal database. It means that protection might not follow the survivor off the reservation, and that needs to change. The same goes for the census of governments. Every five years, 70,000 government entities are surveyed, right down to local sewer districts. But unfortunately, tribal governments have never been included in this process. So when we appeal for federal resources, we do so without any of the data that every other government uses to receive funding, and that has to change. And take an especially close look at technology. The Rural Broadband Development Project regularly reviews technology access in rural America, yet the last technology census of tribal nations took place before Google, before Twitter, or before smartphones even existed. The best data we do have indicates an ongoing digital divide. While 73% of non-Native Americans have access to broadband, sadly enough, in Indian country, it's only 10%. In spite of these barriers, tribes are maintaining their place as the first American innovators. Just last week, President Obama highlighted a public-private partnership that brought high-speed internet access to the Choctaw Nation. In a community where access was once non-existent, today, the Tribal Council has a new tool to engage citizens. The Choctaw School of Language is offering distance education courses and broken Bow School District. It serves over 1,000 students using smart boards, iPads, online lesson pa pa um, plans, and tools that increase parent engagement. I urge Congress and the administration to accelerate work that is underway to partner private sector to expand broadband connectivity in Indian country. We also need a comprehensive and updated study of our technology needs to advance more common sense initiatives like this one to increase our participation in the digital age. 
Of course, there are more legislative and administrative solutions within reach that I can discuss here. But I want to focus on two important areas where bipartisan solutions exist, education and economic growth. No resource is more important in America than the continu continued success and growth of tribal nations and the United States than our children. Education is a treaty right. The greatest way to invest in this precious natural resource is to provide a high quality, culturally appropriate education, one that benefits all Native children and gives Native students the same chance to succeed as their non-Native peers. For Indian Country, it all goes back to trust, flexibility, and local solutions. Focusing on tribal control of schools promises to improve outcomes for our students and creating greater accountability for public schools on reservation lands will ensure that Native students receive the quality education that they need and deserve. We call on Congress to reauthorize the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. We call for the inclusion of tribal provisions to encourage tribal state partnerships, strengthening local control of education and beginning to help every school deliver a high quality education. We also call on Congress to enact legislation that supports native language programs so education for our children is rooted in our history and our culture. <clears throat> Together, as a team, we should also take a hard look at the Bureau of Indian Education Schools. Congress and the administration can do more to make sure that Native youth that attend these schools have high quality teachers, modern technology, and the facilities to deliver excellent education. Along the way, we must continue to seek innovative solutions. That is why I applaud President Obama's proposal to make the first two years of tribal and community college free. It will finally make K through 14 education in America a reality. I look forward to working with Congress and the administration to make this and other necessary investments in our youth, native and non-native. After all, when you think about it, the relatively few dollars we spend on education today will save hundreds, thousands, even millions of dollars in the generations to come. Statistics prove that education destroys poverty and drug and alcohol abuse in all of our communities. Likewise, when it comes to economic growth, what's good for first Americans is good for all Americans. But what can we do to power economic growth within tribes? Growth that has ripple effects far beyond our borders. The answer centers around what tribal governments have proven we can do when Indian country has the flexibility to pursue ideas developed at the local level. When it comes to infrastructure, tribes need safe and well-maintained transportation options and housing, just like the rest of the country. When it comes to revenue, tribes need the authority to raise tax revenue free from overlapping state taxation and to create incentives for business and jobs. I urge Congress to take up significant tax reform this year tax reform that includes tribes and recognizes tribal sovereignty so we 
can better provide essential governmental services and lay the groundwork for growth. I also urge Congress to pass Indian energy legislation like that proposed by Chairman Barrasso. His legislation would provide tribes with greater control and flexibility to develop their traditional and renewable energy resources and would create careers and capital in Indian country. And to further improve access to capital, I urge the administration to remove hurdles in the bond guarantee program and ensure that tribes are included in the new markets, markets tax credit program. With these tools in hand, tribes can more effectively meet local demands with local solutions. Today, I have reviewed the history of our trust relationship and discussed the opportunities and challenges before us. NCAI continues to work to convert the policy ideas that inspire and guide tribal nations today into policy advice for the administration and Congress. Today, as in the past, we are releasing a report called Promoting Self-Determination and Modernizing the Trust Relationship. The report outlines our priorities for this year and identifies specific ways the United States can uphold these commitments. I urge all members of Congress to read it, review it with your staff, use it as an occasion to continue the necessary conversation about how our nations can move forward together. In the end, the relationship that we have inherited, like any good relationship, depends on two things, respect and trust. Here I have a replica wampum belt the nations of the Iroquois Confederacy continue to exchange belts like this one as a sign of peace and friendship. This wampum belt symbolizes the inherent sovereignty of tribal nations. From time immemorial, we have made treaties among ourselves, treaties with the European nations, and treaties with the United States of America. Many generations ago, we did not share a common language, but we did share a relationship of mutual respect and admiration, and a belief that our futures would be closely intertwined. In 1744, Canasatego a representative from the Iroquois Confederacy had a recommendation for colonists from Maryland, Pennsylvania, and Virginia. He said, and I quote, whatever befalls you, never fall out with one another. The same wisdom applies to our nation-to-nation -nation relationship today. In the spirit of Billy Frank Jr., and all those who share a common progress and common prosperity. May we work together to make progress together and build a bright future for all Americans together. When we uphold this trust, we uphold the promise that our nations have always represented and the promise of brighter futures for generations to come. God bless the tribal nations and the National Congress of American Indians. And God bless the United States of America. And go Seahawks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, President Classby, for that powerful speech, and I guess that you can probably recognize the lines that weren't prepared for the speech. 
<laughs> As we do every year, we invite a member of Congress to do the congressional response. And this year, we're really pleased to be able to be joined by Senator John Barrasso. He is the new chairman of the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs, a committee that we work very closely with. Chairman Barrasso has a long, distinguished career in both medicine and public service, and he has served for his served the people of Wyoming as senator since 2007, and he's the fourth ranking member in the Senate Republican leadership as the chairman of the Senate Republican Policy Committee. Please help me welcome Senator John Barrasso. Well, thank you so much for that uh, very warm welcome. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, unlike the President uh, Obama's State of the Union, everyone stayed awake and everyone paid attention. <laughs> Strong. Uh, I did have a chance this morning to uh, speak with uh, Maria Cantwell, former chairman of this committee from your home state. She says, congratulations, and like you, she also said, remind him, go Seahawks. So she is with you. Uh, I want to welcome my friends who are here from the, uh, the Eastern uh, Shoshone tribe. Uh, chairman uh, uh, Darwin St. Clair is here, vice chairman or co-chairman Clinton Wagon, and then of course, uh, Council Member uh, Jody McAdams. So it's good to be joined with each and every one of you, and it's a privilege to be here today joining, joining all of you. Uh, I want to thank you, Mr. President, for the invitation to deliver this congressional uh, response to the State of Indian Nations uh, and to your 81-year-old father at home who is watching. I will say you should be very proud of your son. You have raised an incredible, determined, distinguished and disciplined leader. So thank you, sir. Uh, I'm also uh, privileged to be the new chairman of the uh, of the Committee uh, on Indian Affairs in the United States Senate. I think the last time I came uh, to this meeting in this room on this platform, it was with Senator Danny Akaka. And he was here as chairman. I came as vice chairman because of so much we do is in a bipartisan way. I, have, I called uh, uh, Senator Akaka not too long ago for his 90th birthday. I said, you should come back to Washington. We would love to see you. You have so many friends here. He said, I would love to see all of my friends, and they can come to Hawaii to see me. <laughs> I also want to thank, because you talked about this unprecedented number of bipartisan bills and legislation. I want to thank Senator Tester, who was uh, chairman and I was vice chairman. The reversal of roles is now uh, complete, and he'll be working as, as my vice chairman. But we are equally committed uh, to uh, so much of what you have raised. We have a, uh, much to be done significant amount of work, and we want to do it in a bipartisan way, because this tradition of bipartisanship uh, is emblematic of how we honor our history and our relationship with Indian country. The relationship between the United States and Indian tribes, as you said, has not always uh, been positive, has not always served the people of Indian country well. And as you said, we are not where we used to be. We still have a long way to go. Uh, in recent years, our shared history has experienced landmark improvements uh, for federal Indian policy, but there is still much work to do. This year will mark the 45th uh, anniversary of President Richard Nixon's special, what was called the Special Message to Congress on Indian Affairs. Uh, his message set a new tone and federal policy to promote tribal self-determination, which is still uh, an agenda item and a high priority. Uh, that new federal policy of self-determination has helped tribes create economic opportunities and has given tribes greater control over federal programs. Uh, so we have moved on from where we used to be, but still much work needs to be done. Ind indeed, Mr. President, you noted that there has been remarkable, this is a remarkable moment in our shared history. It's been eight years since a Republican majority was elected to lead the Senate. Uh, so no matter which party is in charge, the people of Indian country deserve action and solutions. The, uh, uh, 
As a doctor from Wyoming, I'll tell you my priority is to help people of Indian country live better lives. There are uh, two tribes in my home state of Wyoming, the Eastern Shoshone tribe, who is here today, also the Northern Arapaho tribe. The tribal leaders of both tribes uh, have uh, stated to me over the years how important it is to have good jobs, health care, public safety in each and every one of their communities. Uh, addressing these fundamental needs can contribute significantly to improving the lives of Indian people. Now, as chairman of the Committee on Indian Affairs, my top priorities are jobs, energy, which you mentioned, and natural resource development, health care, juvenile justice, and tribal self-governance. The more progress that I believe we can make on these issues, the more progress we can make in helping families. So I'm committed to, committed to following in the footsteps of my predecessors who have been chairman of this committee, such as Senator Ben Nighthorse Campbell, who is here today. Now, he is a remarkable leader. Uh, I saw he had a cane today. You know, I'm an orthopedic surgeon. He had a cane instead of a motorcycle. But he's now applying the 70-70 rule. If you're over 70 years of age, the only days you ride your motorcycle is when it's over 70 degrees. <laughs> We've had other great chairmen of the committee, Senator John McCain, Daniel Inouye, John Tester, Maria Cantwell, Byron Dorgan, uh, and of course, uh, Senator Akaka. All of us firmly believe that the best solutions don't come from Congress, they come from Indian country. It is Indian country that we must engage when evaluating federal Indian policy and legislation. With that in mind, the first hearing that I have called as chairman is to receive the views of Indian country on priorities for the 114th Congress, because many of the issues facing Indian communities are not new issues. Now, I am impressed by the commitment expressed today, the commitment to finding innovative solutions, even if it is as modest as simplifying regulations. So I look forward to hearing additional views at this first hearing, which will be held next week. Too often I've heard from tribes that agency rules are confusing. They're duplicative. They're complicated. They're sometimes contradictory. And of course, they're costly. In some cases, these burdensome regulations have prevented economic development in Indian country. These rules further prevent Indian tribes from tailoring programs in such a way that would truly benefit the communities. It is counterproductive for Washington to impose rules which inhibit tribal economies and growth. Washington should be empowering tribes, not restraining them. <laughs> I appreciate the words spoken today that there must be a way to simplify federal regulations and increase local control. I'm dedicated to working with Indian country to achieve these goals. And one of the first bills that I have already introduced in this Congress is the Indian Tribal Energy Development and Self-Determination Act. This legislation will cut the bureaucratic red tape and let tribes develop their energy resources. This bill will streamline the required secretarial approvals of many energy development transactions on Indian lands, such as business agreements, right of ways, and leases. It is bipartisan legislation. It will facilitate renewable energy as well by promoting biomass development. In the words of the president, these are the things that are going to provide for careers as well as capital. Careers as well as capital. And they are based, as you said, on respect and trust. I mean, that's the way we ought to be working. The, the, the goal of this bill is to empower tribes for generations to come. It puts the decision making back into the hands of Indian tribes so they can control their resources, not Washington. The bill has been around in some form or another for a number of times through, I think, four Congresses now. So I urge Indian country and the administration to join me in getting this bill signed into law this year. Empo empowering tribes not only means lifting regulatory burdens, empowerment includes accountability. So the Indian Self-Determination and Education Assistance Act requires that tribes administering Indian programs demonstrate a higher level of responsible governance and administration. Because good governance is vital 
for continuing this policy of tribal self-determination. We should expect no less from the federal agencies as well. As chairman, I'm going to conduct oversight ex hearings on existing federal programs to eliminate waste. More importantly, the committee will examine these programs to ensure that they are working efficiently and productively for Native Americans. Empowerment also means providing tools to govern, such as through economic development. Many tribal economies are agriculturally based. That means water. Careful management of water in Indian country is essential if we are to ensure a reliable supply in the future. Many ranchers and farmers, both Indians and non-Indians, still depend on the Bureau of Indian Affairs to deliver water for their needs. The Department of the Interior initiated several Indian irrigation projects in the late 1800s, the early 1900s, intended as a central component of tribal economies. In most cases, the federal government did not even complete the projects. Today, there is a serious backlog of deferred maintenance to the tune of over $500 million. Deferred maintenance means inefficient water delivery and damaged infrastructure. For the Wind River Reservation in Wyoming alone, these issues are perpetual problems. We talked about it yesterday in my office. The, the department has not developed a long-term strategy in managing these irrigation systems. So to address this backlog, I intend to introduce legislation that would begin addressing the deferred maintenance of these irrigation systems. So I thank the National Congress of American Indians for supporting both the Indian Energy and the Irrigation Bills through their resolutions passed last October. So thank you for getting that done. These measures are small but important pieces to several tribal economies, and, and, and I don't plan to stop, stop at this point. I intend to continue uh, the conversation with Indian country on economic development issues throughout this entire Congress. Today, we heard many examples of how tribes are engines of economic growth and innovative governments. While we triumph in Indian country innovation and progress, we cannot forget those that still need attention and help. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt once said that, quote, the test of progress is not whether we add more to the abundance of those who have much, it is whether we provide enough for those who have little. I, I cannot think of any more deserving of our attention than the most vulnerable Indian children. Indian country innovation and input will be critical in reversing federal policies that have worked to the detriment of Indian people and have not worked at all for Indian children. In particular, we will draw upon Indian country's experience to strengthen accountability measures. For example, 2010, I co-sponsored and Congress passed the Tribal Law and Order Act. This act established the Indian Law and Order Commission to examine various aspects of criminal justice in Indian country, most notably juvenile justice. The commission's report highlighted alarming ju juvenile justice issues, alarming. According to this report, Indian juveniles are held in detention at higher rates and for longer periods of time than any other juvenile population in the United States. Too often, these young people are not provided the educational or rehabilitative services needed to help them turn their lives around. Tribal leaders have expressed concerns that a significant portion of their younger generation is being lost to the juvenile justice system. Many of these juveniles may end up in the adult justice system at some point in their lives. This matter has, for me, been too long overlooked. So I urge Indian country to join the committee in examining these problems, finding a path forward for these young people. The Indian population is increasing and becoming younger. The life expectancy of Native Americans is unacceptably low. Alcoholism and suicide, as you have mentioned, Mr. President, are some of the leading causes of death. And on the Wind River Reservation, my home state of Wyoming, the average age of death is 49 years old. This type of low life expectancy is similar on other reservations. So we should not be satisfied that Congress passed 
a law called the Indian Health Care Improvement Act or the Tribal Law and Order Act. We must remain diligent in ensuring that these measures are working for the benefit of Indian country to address these troubling death rates and juvenile issues. I recognize that the evolution of the federal tribal relationship remains a work in progress. I intend to lead these efforts in a continued government to government relationship, respecting the power of each Indian tribe to govern itself. I am confident that we will continue to find common ground which improves the lives of Indian people. Together, we can make progress in helping Indian country succeed and celebrating the promise of our shared values. Again, thank you so very much for inviting me to be with you here today. I look forward to working with you in the years ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Barrasso. At this time, we'd like to welcome any questions that may come from the press here in our audience. Um, and if you, if you have any questions, a uh, staff member will come to bring you a microphone right here in the front. If you could please state who you're with. And um, as I said earlier, if we could uh, make sure that we keep our questions um, brief, that would be helpful. Jamie, microphone. I'm still waiting for one right here in front. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Levi Rickert, Native News Online. This is for a president. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the uh, <clears throat> emphasis that NCAI will put on the Washington NFL team, and you mentioned FedEx. Do you think it's time for tribes around the United States to boycott the FedExes of the world, Coca-Colas of the world? Once again, part of our, like I said, we have to tell our story, tell our story, tell our story. Uh, all too often, uh, people don't understand the history of that term and uh, the genesis of it. So uh, it is our opportunity to uh, go and educate FedEx, let them know how harmful that term means to us and that it is connected to genocide, the genocide of our people. And uh, Lord willing, they will make the right decision. Uh, we haven't uh, got to the point yet where we have started talking about boycotts, but that's definitely got to be in the conversation. I can add to that. Um, but there are tribes that are making some personal choices already, um, and organizations. NCAI stopped using FedEx last year. Um, Native American Rights Fund has stopped using FedEx, and I know other tribes have, have stopped doing that. We have sent them letters and let them know that also. Thank you. Next question. Somebody, in the audience? Yes, right over here. Thank you. Hi, how are you doing? Um, my name is Tyler Bass, and uh, I'm with Laszlo Congressional Bureau and NPR's National Native News. Um, I spoke with Senator Daines from the Senate Indian Affairs Committee just after the State of the Union, and his immediate concern with the two-year community college proposal that the president has is that uh, he's not really sure about how that would really support, do anything that Pell Grants aren't already doing. Oh, no, that was a... It was Senator Lankford, not Deans. And uh, secondly, I, I just, if you get the, the time, uh, I was wondering if you had any comments on a story that was appeared in The Economist this morning about uh, Northwest tribes and gaming and uh, its general thesis and that of the study being that the disbursement of gaming funds was uh, leading to increased unemployment and exacerbating poverty on, in the Northwest. So thank you for your comments. Sure, to your first question, you know, it, the, the statistics don't lie in Indian country and outside of Indian country that when uh, you, you have a room full of educated people right here, people in this room who are productive members of society, people who are not in the court systems, um, maybe not all of you, <laughs> people that are not in the prison systems, people that are not in the uh, treatment centers. These here are educated individuals right here in front of you. And when you give 
an individual an opportunity, and the statistics don't lie. High school graduates, two-year graduates, four-year graduates, master's degree holders, PhDs, anyone who has had an opportunity and a chance to get educated, they break, break that cycle, and that's what we're all about in Indian country. We're breaking the cycle of education and drug and alcohol abuse. It wasn't that long that many of you know our grandparents were in the boarding schools, and that boarding school experience was a historical trauma that we're still trying to overcome. Because of that time in our history, it created a generation of alcoholics because of the way they were treated in those schools. The physical abuse, the mental abuse, the verbal abuse, the physical abuse, the sexual abuse. And uh, so education is the key for not only Native Americans, but for all America. It is criminal that we have $2.1 billion in student debt right now. That is, that is, that should be unacceptable for the greatest nation in the world. And so this investment in our kids to create a K through 14 program will save this government money in a generation. Statistics show that these kids, when they're educated, they will be productive members of society. They will be uh, paying taxes to the federal government. So this small investment into our children will create dividends for the next generation, I guarantee you. On that story, um, I haven't had a chance to uh, read that story, so I, I can't really comment. Jackie, I don't know if you've had an opportunity no. to see it yet. It was, it was essentially, the microphone's not working, but essentially the claim was that the disbursements discourage people from actually getting, the, the disbursements by the, uh, the, the gaming actually discourage people from then finding work because they essentially break even with how much they would receive at minimum wage or comparable positions. Yeah, once again, I can't comment on that. Uh, you know, I know that uh, once again, we're breaking a cycle and uh, it would be unfair to me uh, not to be able to see how they conducted the survey, who was the, um, the, the uh, participants in the survey, how many tribes were collectively included in this. So um, I will get a chance to read that today and just uh, maybe give a talk or call to the reporter since it happened in the Northwest. I'm going to take a, a question from online, one of our online watchers, um, Mark Truhant. He said, I'd like to hear about um, what we're doing to fix the ACA so Indian country is a state for Medicaid administration improving health funding. So um, I'd like to answer this question because this is an important issue. We have many states um, where Indian country is where we don't have access to the um, expansion program because of the state's choices. And one of the things that Indian country is looking at is alternative options. We've talked about you know, some really interesting concepts, but one of them is maybe Indian country should be its own 51st state for the purposes of implementing programs like the Medicaid expansion program. Um, I'd like to see if there's any other questions from anybody here in the audience, right over here, and then we'll yes. go up there. Hello? Yeah, oh, over there, yes. Yes, go yes. ahead. Uh, Chairman Clatisby, uh, this is Vincent. Yes, this is Vincent Schilling from Indian Country Today Media Network. Hello, Vince. Hi, how are you? Uh, uh, Mr. President, uh, we've been doing so much for our Native youth. We have Joe Revolito here for the Center for Native American Youth. Um, we have Senator Heitkamp is doing a bipartisan bill right now for the benefit of Native children, health and welfare. Chair, uh, musician Michael Boucher has a Native, uh, You Are Not Alone network to help against suicide. With so much in Indian Country going on to help our children, um, and so many good things. The Obama administration just went to Standing Rock. How can we keep this momentum going to stop our children from taking their lives and, and, and instead learning that Indian country has a lot to offer? There are so many great things out there for them. What can we all do collectively? Um, I just have to say also, I appreciate very much uh, your passion and what you're doing. I am honored to have you as the president of the National Congress of American Indians. Thank you. Thank you, Vince. And it's probably safe to say that every tribal leader sitting in this room today, every tribal member is aware or has had youth in their communities that have chosen the path of suicide. Once again, it goes back to us as leaders working with our youth to break that cycle of historic trauma it still plagues our communities today. 
and it is very, very sad. We all have programs, we all have mental health workers, we all have counselors, but we have to continue to look not only within but without for the solutions that we need. This is gonna take a team effort. And once again, it's all about breaking that cycle. It's all about giving our children the opportunities I don't think we're, Lord willing, I wish we would be able to fix this problem 100%. But with so much drug abuse, alcohol abuse, high unemployment rates, things that we have to work on, those are all part of the things that we, as leaders, need to work on to make our communities a better place to live. And so it's just, it's just a sad issue, but it's one that every one of us as leaders are affected by. So, right, what was the second question? Was there a second we, question? We have a, a question from up there in the audience, and then we'll go down <clears> here <throat> to um, Lance. Lance. Uh, good afternoon. My name is David Clark. Um, I'm Aleut from Anchorage, Alaska, um, and I'm here with the Native American Political Leadership Program at George Washington University. Um, so you were just talking about um, historical trauma and how it plagues our communities. And I'm personally noticing that, you know, not only within my family, but with everybody around me. Um, I attend college in an urban area where um, a lot of the Native students have an extremely high dropout rate, uh, usually due to reasons like um, family problems, alcoholism, drug addiction, or just simply, you know, um, microaggressions that, you know, deter them uh, from those uh, different things, you know, and, and I'm also studying sociology. So I'm wondering, uh, what is your opinion um, on uh, addressing historical trauma directly uh, to youth that are um, facing those issues today? And um, do you believe it? Do you think that it's that it can be empowering or is it a double edged sword? As I travel across Indian country, I am so proud of the fact that I can go to Indian any Indian community across the nation and ask the question, how many of you children or how many of you parents are raising kids in a drug and alcohol free home? And the hands are going up just in Atlanta when NIGA honored our youth at our NCAI convention in Atlanta. I asked that question of the parents and the youth that were sitting in that room, there was two to 300 in that room and I asked that question, how many of you are breaking the cycle? How many of you are raising your kids in a drug and alcohol free environment? And three quarters or more of the room raise their hands. So once again, it starts at home. It starts with the person saying that I want my kids to be raised in a better environment than I was raised in. And I encourage all the youth that are still waiting to be parents to make that promise today that the way we break historical trauma is breaking the cycle of drug abuse, alcohol abuse, and dropout rates. <clears throat> and I, and I, like to, I like to say this, it's been my great grandfather, grandfather, father, I, all abused alcohol. And my two grandkids that are seven and two right now, they are the first ones in my family in 100 years to be raised in a home with no drugs, no alcohol, no marijuana, no cigarettes, no crack, no crank, no cocaine, no nothing. And that's how you break the cycle. <laughs> Giving your children that opportunity to succeed. In my parents' generation, I mean, high school graduation wasn't even, I mean, a goal. And now my grandkids, college education is, you know, that's, that's going to be part of their life. So great question, thank you. Lance. Yes, well, President Glasby, I'd like to thank you for your words and I'd like to thank Senator Barrasso for his words. Um, but there was a glaring issue that um, I didn't hear in your, in your speech, and that has to do with the Cartieri fix. We are the 560, uh, fi 565th tribe, okay? Uh, it took us 32 years. And your um, nation against Lance? Your my nation? name's Lance Gums, I'm from the Shinnecock Indian Nation in New York. And uh, mm. 
as that 565th tribe, it took us 32 years to go through this process. And when we get to the end of this process, now we're faced with this issue, the Cartier issue, and a, and a clean Cartier fix. I didn't hear anything in your speech about that, and I'd just like you to comment on that and where uh, NCAI is uh, intending on moving with that you know, over the course of this year. Thank sure, you. That's, that's a great question, Lance. And once again, we weren't able to get every single issue into the speech. And, uh, um, but we met with the chairman, the new chairman of the Natural Resources Committee yesterday, uh, chair, uh, chairman, Bishop. chairman Bishop from Utah. And uh, we were very clear that that is an important part, um, an important goal for Indian country to get a clean car cherry fix. We will be uh, testifying next week and uh, Senator Barrasso already knows how important a clean car cherry fix is. And once again, we need help from Indian country. Right now, last year, when we closed last year's Congress, we only had 13 senators that had signed on for a clean car cherry fix. We need 60 senators to make it happen. So we're a long ways from getting a clean car cherry fix. And so we're going to continue to work hard on that. We're going to continue to uh, look for our friends on both sides of the aisle in the Senate. Uh, I believe Senator, I mean, Congressman Cole mm -hmm. and um, um, Congressman yes, McCollum have already dropped their, mm -hmm. their, um, their bills uh, on the House side. And so we just need to continue to look for those champions on the Senate side to get a clean car cherry fix because it does uh, s create two groups of tribal nations in the United States, which is unacceptable. So we're, we're going to continue to work hard on a clean car cherry fix, Lance. I have a, uh, another question from the um, website. Are there any policy initiatives and or proposals to remedy the adoptive parents case? And this really is the baby Veronica um, case, would you like to respond mm -hmm. to that? Yeah, the, once again, uh, the Indian Child Welfare Act was passed in 1978. And uh, just like the, the Karcheri uh, case, you know, we are seeing court decisions that are eroding that legislation. The Baby Veronica case is one example, and I believe we have an example in Alaska right. also. Mm -hmm. Baby in Don case. The Baby Don case. So, uh, you know, we need to continue to be diligent because in my parents' generation, and I've heard the stories of children being ripped out of their homes in my parents' generation for just unbelievable reasons. I was saddened to hear that children were ripped out of their families' homes. The reason on that paper was their yards were dirty. Hard to believe, isn't it? We cannot go back to those times when the federal government, our state government, were taking our children out of our communities. And I encourage all tribal leaders, I encourage Congress, the Senate, to make sure that you make those Indian child welfare laws stronger so our kids aren't being taken out of our communities. Is there any other questions here in the room? Yes. Oh, we have, do you have a mic up there? We have a, a mic, and then we'll go to Chairman Stevens, and then I can grab something online. Um, I have several questions regarding mm. um, online while we're waiting, to, several questions just to let people know about um, urban health, particularly for our youth. We'll get to that. Yes, go ahead. Hello, my name is Zane Ristel. I'm a part of the Cherokee Nation tribe out of Northeast Oklahoma. I attend the University of Oklahoma, and I'm also here with the NAPLP, Native American Political Leadership Program at George Washington, uh, as a student. Um, I'm a student in finance and accounting, and so my big emphasis is, uh, is economics. And my big question is, what are we doing about progressing our tribe members into being self-sustaining financially? Um, are there any courses that we can offer in order to instruct our youth to budget properly or to invest in outside companies? And also, I mean, how do we get our members into corporate offices? How do we get our, how, how, what incentives do we have for a large company to hire a Native American a tribe member rather than another applicant? Are, are there any health care laws that we could kind of manipulate in order to, uh, you know, maybe give these large companies a break 
on healthcare for our members since we, it's majorly, majorly already offered. Great. So yes, we're really um, excited actually to see so many of our youth wanting to expand their horizons and and bring back some of that those expertises back to our our tribal communities. Um, some of the incentives that we have right now on financial education, we call it financial capacity. We actually have a staff member, Sh Sherry Selway Black, who has been working on that and been on the President's Financial Capacity Building Committee. Um, and we've been providing trainings and workshops for tribal leaders. In fact, at our Atlanta meeting that we had, we had a full day meeting on building financial capacity, and tribal leaders were sharing examples of the programs that they're implementing in their own communities. Programs to be able to help them with teaching investment with their youth, programs that they're doing with their youth. NCAI has an investment game that we offer to high schools across the country to compete against each other. In fact, our staff competed against them once, and I won't tell you where we ranked. But um, <laughs> but anyway, moving on. Um, and, and we do encourage tribes to develop those partnerships, particularly with corporate alliances where they believe that they will have future investments so that we can learn those skills and bring them back in the energy industry for for example, is a great place for us to do that. Um, and we look for those incentives like we've had in with the other programs in the federal government, such as the teacher's assistance programs and the health um, care, uh, aid um, assistance programs that allow us to be part of those, um, those, um, uh, those programs. So thank you. Um, over here to Ernie Stevens. Give me okay. Just quickly, I want to say, you know, I just watched, I just watched Pawi Rivera and Bill Mendoza walk out of here. Uh, one works in the White House, one works in a, in a, um, a major uh, lobby firm in town here. They're very young men. I'm standing right here next to the new vice chairman at Saquon, Mr. Murphy. You know, th these are young people that have walked through the ranks here. I'm looking at young people that are so powerful here. And so, you know, when we talk about uh, um, uh, the pre President Gladys, we talked about the NCAI. My son is on the tribal council. He's a young man who, who grew up with challenge. But as he's getting ready to speak to all those young folks, he said, Dad, it's my 15th anniversary. He said, I'm clean and alcohol drug free for 15 years today, you know? So what, what I really want to emphasize is that, is that we have so many young men and women warriors that are doing so much for Indian country. Those are the ones, and that's why we try to t t uh, steer away from the future leaders. I want to tell the young people, they are leaders today, not future. Right now, these young people are leaders today. So um, my son Brandon works with the uh, uh, My Brother's Keeper Initiative with the White House. Again, that's empowering young warrior men to learn how to be big brothers others, to be fathers, to be, to be powerful roles, role, role models in their community. And I think that's the real key component here. All of us, and, and I'm an Oneida, so we have a very strong uh, women leader, leadership model in our world as a matrilineal society, and it's built right within that wampum that uh, the president holds uh, for us today. So I think, th I think it's just really important that we, we understand that we have powerful young people, and I think those are the ones that help us deal with the matters like suicide prevention and alcohol and drug abuse because those evils are out there. And just quickly, Mr. <clears throat> President, on, on the issue of, of uh, per capita, the per capita thing, you know, where they say that we're having struggle because of those, for the most part, tribal programs have things in place. And for the most part, we educate our young people to deal with those. But for the most part, per capita payments in any country are very small. And for the most part, there is no per capita payment in your country. So these tribes that do have them usually are because they have very small populated tribes. And we won't go into a history lesson. You already did that, and, and, and uh, Chairman Barras already did that, about why tribes have, have a small population to struggle in American history. So we're doing well. Indian country's doing well. It's progressive, and we're working together. And the only way we help our young and help these communities, we work good, stand strong, and listen to your words today. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At this time, we are um, out of time. I want to let people know that I submitted questions online that we will be responding to everyone who sent um, questions in. If you have still questions in the audience, our staff is here. And before we leave, I want to thank everybody who is out there in cyberspace watching today. Thank you for being with us. And especially thank you for the press who helped carry and reverberate our message. Thank you, Gunas Chish, Gunas Chish, ho ho. Thank you.